Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Gilberto Câmara. Gilberto Câmara is the IMPIS Director General since 2005. He serves on the editorial board of the journals Earth Science Informatics, Journal of uh, Special Information Sciences, Computer Environment and Urban, Urban System. Gilberto uh, supervised 18 PhD theses and 24 master theses up to now, and he received recently a Doctor Honoris Causa from the University of Münster, Germany, and is a fellow of the Faculty of Information Science and Earth Observation of the University of Twente, the Netherlands. According to Google Scholar, he has an age index of 27 and he has over 3,800 paper citations as of uh, October 2011. He uh, was also one of the leaders of uh, free software development, including Spring. Please welcome Dr. Gilberto Camera. Well, I would like to thank Raul and Gilson and uh, all the Claudia and all the organizers for making me uh, speak today. It's, of course, a great honor to speak towards a GeoBio audience uh, group, which I think is very important, and I would like, during my talk, to try to highlight some of the issues which I think could be part of the research agenda of GeoBio. I would, what I'll try to do is... Uh, cover some of the work we have done in the INPI, but also point to some issues which I think are challenges of research for all of us. Uh, so we are basically facing a situation where although some of us might agree or disagree that we have uh, uh, global climate change, uh, it is not without doubt that we have a global change. And global change not only climate, but also everything related to our civilization. Our nations are withdrawing themselves, and uh, there's a lot of change in the earth. There's new areas of the uh, food production which are needed to feed the 9 billion people. We have the emergence of the uh, countries like China with enormous consequences for all of us. And I think this presents a, a fantastic opportunity for the work we do in the, I would please allow me to call geoinformatics, the discipline we are in, involved with in all its various guises, parts to be geobio, parts what we would call GIS, part what we call remote sensing. But I think that uh, there's a common some common issues which have to do with our mains of research. And some of them are questions that I think we can help answer. Things like where are the changes? And how much uh, change is happening? And who is being affected by the change? So I think all of these are crucial. And why is geoinformatics poised to make a contribution to these questions? Because we have disciplines very well established. Some strange. Let me take uh, this out, which I have cancelled. Okay. Put in silent mode. Now, uh, we have the disciplines, the big players in, in mathematical and physical disciplines, the physical sciences, the modelers, which have uh, worked their lives in um, developing this uh, physical equations which describe processes. Some of them you know from the climate modeling side and weather modeling side and hydrological modeling, which are very important things. But we are in a world where some decisions or many of the decisions which are affecting global change are taken by society, are taken by people. And I think that what we do in geoinformatics in the end are the crucial issues that enables the links between nature and society. 
if we leak of the most of important work we do, which was presented in this conference, some of them I saw yesterday, uh, if you think about it, it's uh, in the end, and lots of it, or most of it, would be the discussions between links between nature and society. We use our technologies to identify areas of nature which have been uh, changed by society. And one of the, of course, uh, premises of uh, GeoBio is that Earth information data, which is one of the primary sources of the things we do, uh, and of course uh, the subsidiary data which is coming quite in importance of geosensor webs uh, would provide key information about change but as we know it's hard and we should consider that important otherwise we don't have a job uh, or we don't have a geobio community that that information needs to be extracted and modeled now the next step is, of course, that as soon as we reach some good situations about being able, and I think we have had tremendous progress, as uh, the keynotes of yesterday shown, uh, Heipke and Laschke, uh, shown that we have tremendous progress on information extraction. As soon as we uh, say, oh, okay, that's fine, is that uh, what GeoBio is about? And I would like to point to one issue which will become, in my view, important to this community, which is a change. So the issue now becomes if you can model the information in one image or extract it in an effective way, uh, now how can you use this information to describe change? And so communication change, modeling change, extraction change is hard. And, and, and I think this is the next challenge, and my point is this one of the next challenges for this community is being involved in techniques to model and understand change, taken from our primary source of data. So we can ask a, a question, when did the ROC reach the tipping point? You could say, well, I have to do a lot of work to reach that, yes, and how, what are the guiding, some of the guiding points which we should look when we move towards the analyzing and doing a very good job of extracting information to one image and then we move to the next part which is extracting information from a large sequence of images and that's where I think we have some interesting challenges. I will be talking about two concepts which are not perhaps so familiar here at the community, which is events and processes. I will go back uh, more in detail later, but in general what we're talking about is things that we associate with things that happen or occur. So when did this flood happen? It is not necessarily an object, and I'll come back to it later, but something that happens to objects we consider in our day-to-day uh, -day life. So, points here is what types of change can be described with using geo objects? And uh, what is the role of geo in describing change? I, I think this is more a provocation to you rather than a question that I will respond. But I will point to some issues. First of all, we know, know, and there is a debate yesterday about uh, objects, but it's, in the end, that's what we are trying to do, is extract some constructs, and I use conceptual constructs as a word to refer to geo objects, conceptual constructs, are things that in our mind we conceive, and then we come to identify in an image. In this case, it was a data from deforestation that we use in INPI, and the yellow part is objects uh, that we have clustered together under a heading of deforestation that happened uh, until 30, 13th of August of 2003. So this, these are segments uh, which have been clustered together to form one big object. And this big object from our conceptual point of view at EMP is what is the past, the past deforestation. And then we have identified two new or some new objects uh, which are clustered also in this case because it's 
we look at it, them clustered, we could look at them individually. That's uh, a question which we'll come back to it later. But here we say these are the objects that uh, together, taken together, show me the deforestation that happened uh, between 13th of August and uh, 7th of May of 2004. Then we go to the next step and uh, say, well, and then there is uh, new objects coming, and these new objects are the deforestation that happened from 17th, 7th of May of 2004 until 21st of May of 2004. So we are constructing objects in our minds. Deforestation does not exist here. It's in our minds. And we assign them to places uh, and uh, to uh, times or to time intervals in the image. So this uh, leads me to my first point, which is uh, images are obviously a source for geo objects, but they are not a, uh, they are a very particular sort of uh, source. And there's a paper we published in COSIT, uh, Egenhofer, Fonseca, and Miguel, which is called What's in an Image, where we say first that uh, images has what we call an observer-independent ontological status, in the sense that they are independent from the observer, they are captured from a sensor, and therefore they exist outside our conceptual construct. And the other point we made then is that, for, in our point of view, and for the things we want to do, remotely sensitive images are essentially measurements for capturing landscape dynamics. And that's the most important thing we can do with them. And uh, to do this, we might want to make some distinctions, which all of us do make, but of course sometimes we don't uh, care or we don't have the time to make them explicit or to put them in paper. Uh, the first point, that images are acts of measurement, that I think that is all accepted. The other point is was made yesterday, I believe it was by Christian, if I'm not uh, mistaken, about segments not being objects, segments being mathematical constructs. Was it you, Christian, that said that? Yes. So that leads to the next point. If segments are not objects, objects exist outside of the segments. So the, the consequence of that is there are the, in fact two ontologies. One is what we extract from the images, the mathematical constructs. So we have, which, which I would call physical ontology, which is of course the pixels and the values uh, of reflectance that are imbued in the pixels, and the structural ontology, which is the segments that we extract from them. But they're not conceptual constructs as such. They are mathematical constructs because they are exact extracted by very clear mathematical artifacts which are, are code, algorithms. And we have objects, but the objects are conceptual constructs which exist in our minds. So when we uh, say, for example, that these, uh, I think there are six of them, six uh, red, or uh, yes, red bits here belong to one object that is an act that has nothing to do with existing reality this is a concept because in now the way we do things at imp for deforestation we don't distinguish between individual objects we might want to do if we someone else wanted to identify each segment and assi assign to each object we might want to take a different way of assigning, uh, let's say, our conceptual constructs from the same mathematical construct. So uh, we would say that the image has the right to exist and the segments have the right to exist outside of our conceptual constructs. So uh, this is the first point, and, and, and the, yeah, but point is, geo objects exist, at least conceptually, segments exist and there is we what we do all the time is mapping from one to the other according to our particular ways and wishes for the application now with that armed with that mindset we can do lots of things and one of them uh, Marcelino which is somewhere in the audience I think he is oh he is there uh, Marcelino uh, did his PhD thesis with us and published a paper 
called Detecting Agents of Land Use Change in Tropical Forest Areas. Well, the idea was uh, conceptually simple. We have people, and people change the landscape. Now, people are different. They're different, and they uh, sometimes uh, work together, sometimes work individually, sometimes they're rich, sometimes they're poor. And uh, the way they change the landscape reflects what they are. And therefore, we can identify not them individually, but at least their signatures in the land or their patterns. If you're rich and you're a big farmer, you tend to cut areas of forest in a regular and big way. If you are a small, uh, poor guy going down the, the river to get some uh, castanhas do Pará or some, how do you say castanhas? Castanhas is in English is Brazil nuts, isn't it? Yes. So you would cut along a corridor, a road. If you were a group of people who were being colonizers, you would actually uh, occupy land according to a fishbone pattern. So in a certain area, you could assign things like you say, well, these are irregular patterns. Some, someone went there and cut a piece of land just to, for his small family. Someone had uh, built a road and, and he, went to, he went there and this is a uh, road building to a small settlement. Someone has a big area and you can actually distinguish between these patterns. And these then are each individual bit there might be, as in GOB a parlance, a segment. But here, what you are assigning to them, you are assigning some meaning to the, to the shapes of these uh, segments. And by means of some, uh, uh, in the, our case, a uh, data mining classifier, you can actually uh, tell the story of the landscape. So this was this landscape in 82 and 85, you have a clear linear pattern, which is the road. You have some irregular patterns, which is basically people going in and settling the land in small farms. And you see from 82 to 85 very few of the regular patterns. And as time goes on from 85 to 88, and then from 88 to 91, and then from 91 to 94, and furthermore from 94 to 97, you see a clear increase of the regular patterns, and this has a meaning. This is a clear meaning. And what is the meaning? The meaning behind this is, for example, take now 2000, and then you put them together, 85 to 2000. The meaning behind this is there is a story. Uh, Brazilian uh, land tenure rights were given to people, and these tenure rights mandated that they could have a tract of land I think was less than 50 hectares for their own subsistence. But people, many people could not survive in the forest, so they sold it. They sold it and to people who had some more money. And the guy who had some more money could get some more, mo more money by having more land and in turn bought more land. And of course, the uh, guys who want more land would do uh, more of the regular patterns. So you would see uh, that uh, the regular patterns appear. This is a clear sign of land concentration. And of course, which means that the government plan for settling many colonists in that area has failed. Large farmers have bought the parcels in an illicit way. So you can see clearly by assigning meaning to the segments, we turn them into objects and with them we can tell a story. So this is part of what the change can be captured in object or objects, uh, you would say this is a classic case of GOP, uh, capturing change, yes. And therefore, we need uh, to come up with uh, this idea that in many of the things we do, we have to talk about the land change objects. Objects uh, which you would come to an agreement with them, you would try to recognize them in the image, by some of their uh, geometric, topological, and, and spectral properties. And you also would recognize that these uh, properties, especially the boundaries and, the, and the, their, um, the relations to the others, their uh, topology would change in time. So uh, recently we came 
to that was COVID paper 2009, where we really did discussions how do you discover the evolution of an object. So the idea now that if you have you would extract your objects from a GOB perspective and then you want to describe how ha they have evolved and then you need some in our case wasn't we are very much algebraic technique this was written in a functional language called Haskell but or in, in use case based reasoning but you could try your own technique that's not the case that you should use any of the things we did but the issue is uh, use a technique to describe, for example, the fact that this uh, piece of lead coalesced together from small parts. So you are trying to say this guy bought lead from the others and became a big farmer. How did he do that? I have the evidence to show that because I can trace the evolution from that from the images. So this is one example which shows uh, that you can do a lot with uh, GeoBio. Uh, using uh, data. But there's more to it. Uh, I think there's more to it. One of the crucial things which have been evolving recently is the availability of time series of satellite data. Unfortunately for GeoBio, this has come about in the terms of MODIS, which has a resolution which is not the resolution of the dreams of the GeoBio people who love to think about uh, uh, meter size data but uh, you have, as I think everybody here in this community is pragmatic you have to do with what you have and in fact this is a fascinating data set which I, I think many of you have seen and uh, in this case we have it for the whole of Brazil which is basically for every modis pixel so that, that is a modis pixel there so in the background is a Landsat image and you have a modis pixel. The modis pixel is the square one, you see the problems of resolution. But the, the, whatever the problems of resolution are, you are clearly set with something which is fascinating from a, a change perspective point of view, which is this signature here, the time series. And you can tell enormously a lot from the time series that you could never Never. There's no way you can extract that from looking at a single image. It is the evolution. In this case, you see something very interesting. You see, uh, first of all, you have the GeoBio gives us the boundaries. So if we look at the boundaries of that object there and we assign it to a shape and we have a shape classifier, which assigns them to these objects to a type of agricultural practice which is a rotating pivot in that case we know something about that object well that's probably someone who put there a rotating pivot and he has been using that area for lots of time and we of course would have to look at every image here or a lot of Landsat images to catch, catch for that but with that we can do a lot what we can do there is to say, well, we have a change. This guy used, and this is our ears, I'm sorry for the resolution, but these are ears, and these are variations on the NDVI, and you can see clearly that from the same, uh, the same uh, object or the same rotating pivot area, he would extract three crops a year. And this in Brazilian parlance is corn. Corn grows, you can get three crops a year in corn in some areas of Brazil. And then you can see the pattern change from 2009 onwards because this guy converted into sugarcane. Because you can see clearly from the pattern that now you have a yearly pattern. In fact, from the first crop of sugarcane, it takes more than a year. And you can see that clearly. So by combining the information about the boundaries of the object with the information about the time series, you can really ask questions. When was this area covered from food to biofuel production. When, uh, when, uh, then you can try different techniques and I'm not selling any particular technique here, that's not my point. My point is saying that by combining 
object space with time series, you do enormously, you do much more, much, much more than what you could ever think about by just using object based image analysis. So this is some of the work that Thales, which is in the audience here, is doing, and this is the geographic data mining analyst. I think it was presented first at the Ghent uh, meeting last year, was it Thales? Uh, and uh, this does a lot of the things I've shown before, but one of the things which are tougher for us is uh, looking at these time series. It can be very noisy. Of course, uh, when you show the example, you always show a beautiful example, but data can be very noisy and very tough. So we are looking at uh, things like, for example, how do you uh, separate a single from a double cropping, and then we try to visualize time series in a polar system, and uh, by that we can see, well, uh, in polar coordinates, which and then you move your time series into polar coordinates, and these are yearly tracks, and then you see a difference between a single cropping and a double cropping. More on that in the next GeoBiotalis, right? If you finish your PhD thesis in time. That's the, always the problem. But let me point out a little bit to the future. I will come back to, briefly to the point which I became a stock in the past. I don't think that, I think, first of all, I try to show you that the GeoBio can uh, can be a fantastic tool for dealing with change. How much time I have, uh, how? I think 10 minutes, yes? yes? If I can get this right, okay. So, uh, so let's say, to recap a little bit, so you can do a lot combining GeoBio with uh, time series. That's my point, and with patterns and so on. That's point one, and I think this but I think you would do even more if you start thinking about events. And uh, the concept of events is, is comes about, about when you think, what is something odd here about, what is, does it sound odd to you that uh, someone say, this is in New Mexico, dust storms may exist. Does it make sense to say dust storms may exist? And this is, since it's New Mexico, it's, it's, it's not in Brazil, so it's not the problem of someone that, no, not knowing English. What would be your, what would int, your intuition uh, say about dust storms? What would be your intuition about dust storms? Well, they may happen they may occur, right? So you would not think of them as existing, but as occurring. And if you go along that line, you would then say, well, there is a distinction then between objects and events. Uh, the distinction is the coast of Japan is an object, but the Tohoku tsunami was an event. Now, the fact that you need this tells you something about what you need to represent change. If you want to capture change, there is only so much you can do if you only think about objects. You all, you have to understand, you, know, you have to model things about events. For example, the ROC is an object or you could argue forever that it's an object. But the disaster of the ROC is not an object. The disaster was an event. So you could argue that to answer the following question, when did the ROC shrink to 10% of its original size, you would also need to capture objects, but you need to represent events. So in our view, we would say that objects exist and events occur. They all are conceptual constructs, but they are, if you say ontologically speaking, they are ontologically different conceptual constructs. So Mount Etna was an ob is an object. The Etna's eruption was an event. So you would uh, think something about this line that uh, I'm not going to 
for example, you have here this different this uh, uh, buoy, a GPS buoy in the uh, in the Sea of uh, Japan, and the GPS buoy has recorded when the tsunami passed, and you can see that the data is clearly an object in this case, not an image extracted object, but an object which is sitting somewhere, and the data from the GPS buoy, and the event is not. You see it here, but it's not here. It's in your mind. The event is when the water, it's the tsunami making the buoy go up and down. So it's really existing. And, and more than that, they are mathematical. And, and, and one way to think about them is that being in categories. I'm not going into category theory, but basically, category theory is the most basic things that, that you can do with. Uh, with uh, things, uh, with uh, types. So, for example, one thing that you can do in event is to compose. Uh, I went home and then I went to bed. So, these are two events. I went home and then I went to bed. And you can say, well, you go went home and went to bed. And you can associate. I came to Geobaya, gave a lecture, and then went to coffee break. And then the same thing would be went to Geobaya, gave a lecture, went to coffee break. So you now have a mindset which tells you something. You need to represent objects. You need to represent objects that change in time. So you need to represent the change. But some of the changes are not expressed as objects. They are expressed as events. I'm not going to the detail of the algebra that we are developing because I think it would be outside the point. But the idea, one of the way of capturing this is defining an algebra. You can, def you can take your own pick to this. The pick that I'm taking is defining algebras where I have some base types like int, real, string, boolean. I have geometry types which, of course, uh, capture our segments in our conceptual objects, but you also, of course, need time. You need to put time there, otherwise uh, it doesn't make sense to capture change. And then you would associate uh, your object here to, they, it, it exists outside your observation. So I'm not going to detail, but the base idea is that the object has a a type of time, a type of geometry, and it's something. For example, can be a string. So if you think about uh, the IOC. So the IOC, you can say at this, time, this, at this time it had a geometry. At this other time it had a second geometry. At this third time it has a third geometry. But it's the IOC. So the object, again, is independent from the observations. It's going back to that idea that images exist, the segments exist in the image, but they are not objects. Objects are what we construct. So objects are here, segments are here, and we say an object maps to different segments and different elements in time. That's what I, well, that's what my algebra captures by saying get the observations. Observations being the segments in this case that characterize the C. And, of course, it had a beginning and an end of my observations. It had a boundary, of course, that changes over time. It had an after and a before. So if tell me what happened to this object before a certain time. Tell me what happened after. And there is a, what happened during this period. So there are certain types of things that you can argue and you can query about your object and uh, your moving object and, uh, or your lane change object. So your position and extent change continuously. In our case, you would say, well, the position does not change that much. Yes, but the extent changes. But the algebraic constructs would not really be much different between a walrus. So the point here is that you would use pretty much the same algebraic constructs that you use for the walrus or the sea lion and what, you, what you would use for the ROC, because what you're saying is you're representing something that has a geometry at each instance of time, that, that geometry varies, 
in that you can ask questions about space and time. And essentially this, this is the, what you, you want to capture. And then inside that object, there is a series of observations, which are your segments, you want to put it this way, which you assign them to be valid within a certain spatial extent and a certain time interval. And if you do that, you can do a lot. But then, the next step is saying, well, there is an event. So you have uh, an episode which a beginning and an end, which is a particular condition of one spatial temporal type. So you would say, well, the ROC or the forest was, well, uh, for example, when the ROC shrank to 10% of its original size, for, don't look at the code, I'm not here putting code for you, uh, but uh, you would say you have to do two things. First of all, get three things, get the time series, extract the segments in each element, assign the segment to a valid time, then assign an event to a certain condition of that object. For example, you would here say, my condition is uh, when that reached the original, you, you have the new size, you have the original size, when that object shrank to 10% of the original mm -hmm. size, and you can call it an event, so it happened here from 1945 or 1950 until 1985, it was okay, sort of okay. But from 85 to then it shrank to 20%. And then from 91 to whatever, it changed to 10%. So you assign much as what we do in deforestation. So this area was fine. And then from a certain point, it had a forest loss of 20%. So that's event number one. Event number two would be when the loss reached 50%. And then event number three, when the loss reached 90%, and event number four, uh, when the, there was a clear cut. So you can see, if, and you can com you clearly combine these events. One comes after the other. And they are particular instances of chunks of time where something happened. And they are not objects. They are conceptually extracted from some property of the object. So with that, you would have the geo objects changing in time, your events capturing the properties of geo objects, and uh, my point is that with that you can discover the history of land change objects. You can do a lot with that. You would have, uh, well, the segments are the essential initial part, but then starting from the segments and the sequence of images and the time series, and a powerful way, in my case I prefer an algebra, but you can choose your own way, uh, to, to combine this, you have a tools to extend this idea of geobia to capture spatial temporal change, recognizing that you need your, to broaden your conceptual constructs. Uh, in our case, of course, we do this in the, in the context of the development of a new generation of uh, uh, space-time databases, but this is for another GeoBio talk. And with that, I would say that uh, we propose that algebras for spatial temporal data are, are, in our view, a very powerful way for representing change. And these, uh, in my view, could be an interesting challenge for, let's say, a lot of the users and applications of GeoBio. Thank you very much. Thank you.